food is an acquired taste. <laughs> That's my thought, and I'm sticking by it. Because I've lived up in Alaska, and I know there are natives up there that used to eat fish, and veggies that grow like sand peas and things that are kind of like growing wild out in the, the tundra, in the bush. And what they would do is a lot of times they would take the, the dried fish, you know, and catch it, and they'd string it up, you know, and let it dry out in the sun, you know, and save that to last through the winter. They would haul in whales, you know, and drag them to shore. This up in Nome, Alaska. And drag them to shore, outside of Nome, drag them to shore and cut up the blubber, you know, and sometimes stick some of the blubber into the ground with the veggies, you know, and let it ferment one year. <laughs> but it's an acquired taste, and I actually had some muck tuck, you know, which is whale blubber. Chewy. <laughs> I'd still be chewing it, too, <laughs> believe me. I don't know what they do with that stuff, but man, you just can't swallow it. It's just chewable. It's like chew, 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 you know, it's like just doesn't, you know, kind of like break up. But food. is an acquired taste. It's also a necessity of life. You need it to live. Now you might get by limping along without eating food for a little while. But eventually the body, the flesh you're in, needs food. Now your soul doesn't need food, but your soul is influenced by food. Certain foods will cause your emotions to react in different ways. They will input your mind and cause your body to overwhelm your soul with feelings of depression or bumming out because you're not getting the right amount of sugars or you know too hyper because you're getting too much sugar. But my mother had an interesting perspective on food. She said, if you're hungry enough, you'll eat it. Because she used to make us eat, you know, whatever was in front of us on our plate. Now, when we got older, we were probably the forerunner of the modern generation. Because, quite frankly, she, uh, being a kind of a single mother, so to speak, she had too many husbands. and. Uh, When we were in high school, my sisters and I, we you know, were pretty finicky eaters, so she would send my sister out to go get drive through. So we would you know, eat because my mother just didn't have time really to fix dinner or cook, and we didn't cook for ourselves because we were always fighting and arguing you know, like brothers and sisters do. So we would eat drive through and I loved it, man. It was like, great, I'm into it. It's like, yeah. And to this day, I still love that kind of food, drive through. But you see, I got broke. So now, I bet you're wondering what this is. Looks like peanut butters and crackers. Nope. <laughs> mm. It's really good. Because you see, one of the things I trained myself on was that if I was hungry enough, I'd eat it. So a lot of times in our house, we'll not have as much variety as most Americans do right now. And it starts getting down to the nitty gritty. I dig out my, my standby package of a matzah. <laughs> matzah this, a matzah that, a matzah here, a matzah there, everywhere. Somebody's always got matzah around somewhere. Hard as a brick. And my hummus that my wife bought for me because I used to keep saying that and for a while I was eating it every day like hummus you know my favorite breakfast really is kind of like a a nice fresh bagel although we don't get fresh bagels we were getting them from Costco. <laughs> now we don't even have Costco cards so <laughs> but you know in Israel, a nice fresh bagel is always wonderful. And then you put some hummus on it, you get some tomato, 
put some, uh, well, there you could get a fish spread that's kind of mixed with vitamins, all kinds of neat stuff, olive oil and everything else. Put some, you know, fish on it, you know, lox, whatever you want to call it. You know, and just mm, out here in Southern California, they basically, the way they're doing it here, for what was going on there, the Gentile version of what Jews eat is uh, sushi. <laughs> they make all kinds of things sushi. You know, they got all this wrapped up, you know, kind of like inside of rice, you know, and then they put all kinds of, you know, fresh things in there that are good for you. Some things I wonder about, you know. But anyways, you know, it's sushi. Sushi is kind of like the Gentile version of bagels and lox. But for me, man, you just can't beat when you're hungry. Hummus and matzah. Now, it's an acquired taste. Hummus is salty, <laughs> but I, in my body, require lots of salt because I went dancing and I do a lot of physical exercise and I burn up salt and I need salt to retain fluids and then I need to drink lots of fluids. So hummus, just a perfect balance for me, made out of chickpeas, garbanzo beans, something. And it's a great source of protein for all you health nuts that are going to go out on Facebook and kind of like, you know, put out some kind of flyer for, you know, oh, eat that and it'll cure cancer, <laughs> please. But you see, if I had the money, I'd be out eating Egg McMuffins. Oh, where, where, where? You know, two for three dollars. Yeah. That's my idea of breakfast. But you know, God being in his wisdom, his timing, his will, his way, I'm not complaining about not having Egg McMuffins this morning. Or for a while. <laughs> I'm enjoying what I do have. And that's the point. What do you have today? What is in your cabinet? What is in your pantry? What is in your closet? What is in your life? Are you enjoying it? Are you making and giving thanks for the things with which God has provided for you? Or are you whining about what you don't got rather than what you do got? Because that's the difference between a mature Christian and an immature Christian. His food etiquette by not talking with his mouthful. No. But rather, a mature Christian accepts what God has given and rejoices in those things that God had provided for him because he knows or she that where they have been is not where they're going and where they're going is not where they are and that today whether you are in prosperity or in poverty God is taking you through it all the way to the end where he will set up a banqueting table. Yea, he has set up a table in the midst of mine enemies. And you've the experience to draw back from your past and own it and enjoy it and thank God for your past to remind you of, in the present of your future. Because if God has brought you through before, he will take you through again. And that's why we don't say forgetting the past, let us press on only but recounting sometimes the things that God has done, retelling them to the generations that exist around us, reminding them that though we may be in a season at this time of oppression, depression, recession, whatever, it's an acquired taste. You can enjoy where we're at today as opposed to being bummed about what you're going through. Because you'll always go through something. You may have had all the money in the world, ate the popcorn, had the cotton candy, you know, down the hot dog, drank the Coke, you know, even threw in a Cinnabon, you know, 
found one of those like you know kind of weird kind of like food things you know at a carnival ate it and then you jumped on like the superman ride or a upside down ride you know stuff and just vomited it all over the place <laughs> what good did it do to have that variety but the bottom line is that being thankful causes you to realize all that you have you have and you will have in the future it gives you a better perspective on eternity and how God sees things better than we do and that this momentary light affliction that we're going through is nothing compared to the weight of glory that is yet to be revealed in us as well as that which is to come even our glorious appearing of Jesus Christ and not only just Jesus coming but also the rewards that he has with him for us although I don't really care about that I just want a tree I don't sit under it and go relax and take it easy for eternity or maybe for a thousand years but the point is he's got rewards for you he's got a banqueting table he's got a place in heaven reserved with your name on a table to feast and to enjoy though I suspect he's probably going to serve like he always has and that we'll feel a little uncomfortable about it but the point being is that hey such a deal when you get to heaven maybe you'll find out that he has instead of matzah and hummus manna and hummus <laughs> oh well so much for the humus jokes or the humor of it all All I had, or all had a share in putting Jesus on the cross. For Christ also hath once suffered for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. 1 Peter 3.18 You know, some people pray before they get their food. Some people pray after they get their food. Some people pray before they even get up. Some people pray while they're up. Some people take an attitude of prayer. Jewish culture, such a deal, prays over everything. Does that mean that they're more spiritual? No. The reality of having an attitude of gratitude is the action and direction that God is looking for you to be in everything. Whether you pray in public, you know, over all your food, you know, and it has a blessing on it, or whether you kosherize it, you know, make it sanctified by the priest, you know, or the rabbi, bing, it's shiny, healthy. Or whether you treat the, you know, grade A US FDA approved, you know, kind of food and drug, you know, kind of stamp seal quality meat <laughs> on a kangaroo. <laughs> the point is, God said, don't worry about it. It's not eat or drink that you should be fearful of, but rather being thankful for what God has given. And so there's a strange conspiracy of silence in the world today, even in religious circles, about man's responsibility for sin. The reality of judgment and about an outraged God and the necessity of a crucified Savior. But still there lies a great shadow upon every man and every woman. The fact that our Lord was bruised and wounded and crucified for the entire human race, not just the ones that we like, but the entire human population of humanity. This is the basic human responsibility that men are trying to push off and evade, that Jesus died for all. Let us not eloquently blame Judas nor Pilate. Let us not curl our lips at Judas and accuse him of traitor. He sold him for money. He was like, you know, falling away. Oh, they were guilty, most certainly. But they were our accomplices in crime. We in accompli fete. Is that French? <laughs> in matter of fact, they and we put him on the cross and not they alone. 
That rising malice and anger that burned so hotly in your breast today put him there whenever you're angry at your brother, whenever you're angry at the world, whenever you accuse someone and recuse them of some kind of sin, you put Jesus on the cross again. Every time that you choose to attack and say what's wrong with God's salvation He's provided because look at them, <gasps> they're not true Christians. You put Jesus on the cross again. Every time that you criticize and ostracize those with whom God has died for, you put Jesus on the cross again. The evil, the hatred, the suspicion, the jealousy, the lying tongue, the cheating, the carnality, the fleshly love of pleasure, all of these in the natural man joined in putting him on the cross. Your religiosity stinks in the eyes of God. For only one reason. And it's not because it's religious. And it's not because it's righteousness. And it's not because it's without merit. But it's because it puts Jesus on the cross again. When you are ungrateful, when you are murmuring about what you don't have, when you want more than what God has given, when you are not content with what things you have, when you say, oh, look at them. You put Jesus on the cross again. But will he die again? Will he be crucified again? Will he one more time take the sin of men upon himself? No, my Lord. You see, though I know when I do these things, when I sin in such a way that I cause God the consternation and the frustration of the reality of what I am, I know He looks at me and says, No, I will not crucify my Son again. With grace for grace, with my loving kindness, with the tenderness of my heart, with the love that I have for you, I will give my grace to you. That you should no longer be that type of person who would crucify Jesus again, but that you would see in the accomplished work of what I have done all that is required of you, but to accept only my Son. Acceptance is the hardest thing we do, because in all of life we're told, do more, be more, live more. Whenever we step out and we get our last glass of Kool-Aid, we want more. Whenever we get wine of a finest kind and we think, oh, we've arrived and we've got all the wondrous toys and caves and joys that the world has to offer us, oh, we want more. So much more. Always more. But what more need God do than what He has already done? What more need be given you except what He has already accomplished for you? If God were to speak to you today, and He can, <laughs> I know, what would you want more than what he has already given you today. What must He do to follow through with you for you to realize all that God has, all that God has done, all that God has made available is already yours. Whether you live in it or you look forward to it or you're waiting for it to be accomplished, it's done. It's already done. There's no reason to crucify Jesus again. There's no reason why the Son must be put back on the cross. Your sin has been forgiven. Your life has been purchased. You have been given the redemptive price by placing His Spirit in you. All you need to do is be aware, care, and dare to see God 
right now where you are and be still and not think you need to oh God help me God forgive me God do it all now lose your cool over the grace that's been given you because Jesus doesn't need to be crucified again God doesn't need to do it again God has already done everything that needs to be done in the name of his son but now the one thing you need to do is to see it through let the spirit of God show you those areas where you're not content where you are thinking you need to do something rather than to let God live in the moment of who you are rather than let God reveal in this moment what you are rather than let God fill you in this moment with who he is rather than let God direct this moment so that you find out all that he has become in you because I don't know about you but I find in me the gratitude that I want to be isn't there the thankfulness the realization of all that salvation really is isn't there I have become content to sit back to lay back to take back all that God went out of his way to do for me and I see it in the hardness of my own heart that I'm not willing to step out to reach out to hold out the salvation I've been given and the grace and the mercy that he's extended to me have we become selfish in our own desires our own wants our own toys our own cares of the world that we have that we've forgotten to share what God has done when Tozer tells me those things of what Jesus has done I think about oh God what have I done what have I done have I not appreciated the sacrifice that though my life may be reduced to even the simplest of things matzah and hummus and Kool-Aid is it not enough that God has provided for me all the days of my life and that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and that I have an inheritance and a promise that I can lay down my life now in order that God may take it up again and use it that I need to lay down my life for the sake of someone else who is desperately needing to hear what Jesus has done because not that Jesus need be crucified again but that Jesus has been crucified for the sake of that person that doesn't know what you know that doesn't understand what you already have been through that maybe just wants to see what it is you can do in sharing the love that God has not just for them but for you are you becoming more like Jesus or less are you giving up more of your life or hanging on to more of the life that God has given you I wonder not for you, but for me.